so, so yeah, thank you so much for having me. Uh, this sounds like a great uh, idea. I think we should do the same at Stanford, like having this first author journal club. Uh, but yeah, it's an honor to kick this off and, and you know, um, I hope I hope you enjoy it. Uh, so so you can, so I'm, I have slides, uh, but again, please feel free to interrupt at any time and just unmute uh, yourself and ask. Um, this doesn't have to be like a, you know, regular talk. We can finish whatever we get to and, you know, uh, no problem. Uh, and I will pause every so often to see if there are questions, but also again, feel free to, to interrupt any time. Um, so I'm going to be talking about some recent papers that, um, that I, uh, worked on here at Stanford with my advisor Vedika and also with Tibor Rakowski, who's uh, another postdoc fellow here. Uh, this paper has been published um, about uh, a couple of months ago, and this follow-up paper came up on the archive uh, last month. Um, so the topic is about non-unitary dynamics, and broadly the motivation is, uh, you know, the advent of NIST devices, this noisy intermediate scale uh, quantum uh, devices, which are both you know, have this interesting dual nature of being both computers, so things we want to use to, to answer questions, uh, but also many body systems in their own right. So, so it's just arrays of, of quantum um, degrees of freedom that we can control and, and with really unprecedented levels of quantum control and measurement. And so these technological capabilities are now also making it possible to ask theoretical questions uh, that maybe didn't make a lot of sense uh, just even 10 or 20 years ago, uh, specifically in far from equilibrium and open system quantum dynamics. And in particular, I'll focus on the dynamics of entanglement, which is very interesting for a variety of reasons, including, uh, you know, it underlies definitions of phase structure out of equilibrium and foundational questions about quantum chaos and thermalization. Uh, and then, of course, you know, all the recent hype about uh, quantum computational supremacy. So all that, that set of questions is also closely tied to entanglement and possibly even high energy uh, questions about the emergence of of gravity and space time from, from entanglement itself. But, but for this talk, we'll keep it more uh, sort of down to earth and we'll just think about uh, dynamics of entanglement in more of a condensed matter type setting. And um, in thinking about this in the last few years, what's been really helpful has been um, thinking about random unitary circuits. Uh, so I have a few of the papers on this, but there's obviously many more. Um, and really in the last two years or so, since 2018, um, this landscape has been expanded to include non-unitary ingredients, particular projective measurements, um, which surprisingly, or maybe, yeah, interestingly, I guess, uh, have shown that you can have really sharp uh, phase structure in uh, the behavior of entanglement, even in the presence of these non-unitary uh, elements. Uh, I guess these are some of the original papers on this. And if you now view this unitary measurement space as, um, sort of having unitary circuits as its subset, then it also makes sense to focus on, on the opposite subset of measurement only dynamics, where uh, the only thing you're doing to the system is just monitoring it in different ways. And also surprisingly, you get this interesting phase structure in the behavior of entanglement even there. There's some papers on this in the last year or so. And finally, all of this lives in the broadest possible uh, space for quantum evolutions, which should also incorporate uh, noise and decoherence and maybe interfacing with, with a classical computer for feedback and, and interactivity and so on and so forth. And all of these um, settings are really motivated again by these quantum computing devices where, where these type of, um, type of issues are going to become more and more important as these devices become, uh, you know, gain, gain prominence in the field. So for today, we're going to be sticking mainly to the unitary measurement space with a little detour into the coherence that you'll, you'll see in, in a moment. Um, so to give you some more context about, uh, I know, you know some of you are experts, but just as a basic uh, primer on, on entanglement phases in monitored circuits, uh, the type of setup we're thinking about is um, something like this with one, you know, one dimensional array of qubits. Uh, these vertical lines are the word lines of the qubits and uh, the qubits are interacting with their nearest neighbor uh, through these unitary processes that are called gates. Um, they're just four by four unitary matrices taken to qubits and um, spit out to qubits. Um, and in addition to that, we are allowed to, uh, in between these gates, go in and measure the state of the qubit. This will be this uh, open circles. Uh, say you're measuring the spin in the, in the Z basis and getting either up or down and collapsing the wave function onto that state. Uh, and we're doing this with some rate P, which can be taken between zero and one. So uh, two points here are very easy to understand. So P equals to zero, 
um, means that you're not doing any of these measurements. You're, you're back to the case of unitary dynamics, and that's something that we have a fairly good understanding of. And absent constraints on the gates, that gets you to a thermal steady state. Uh, not a steady state, but like a steady state value of entanglement, which achieves a volume law value, uh, like in a thermal phase. Um, conversely, the, the point where you're measuring everything all the time, so p equals to one, every single uh, after every single gate, you're measuring both the outputs. Well, then this is very reminiscent of the quantum zero effect, where you're just monitoring everything all the time, and you're basically not giving your state any chance of evolving away from a product state. So then you clearly have no entanglement. So the surprising and interesting thing was that these two somewhat trivial points actually extend to phases in the entire interval of monitoring rate from zero to one. Uh, with a critical value that's you know model dependent, uh, but the important thing is that uh, you have this volume law entangling phase that exists from measure monitoring rate of zero to some finite value. And interestingly, this volume law entangled phase is non-thermal. Like it has some properties that are sharply different from a conventional thermal uh, volume law phase. Um, and this critical point really behaves like a quantum phase transition with logarithmic scaling of entanglement and a variety of other uh, conformal field theory like uh, behaviors that have been observed. Matteo? Um, yes. I, sorry to interrupt the mention here. No, 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 please. Uh, just a quick question. I mean, uh, I, I, you might have said this, but I missed it. When you talk of these random injuries, like thermal here just corresponds to the infinite temperature state or like what is thermal? Uh, what, right, what so device? here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, good. Uh, so here, thermal, if you just sample the gates out of the uh, HAR measure on, on all unitary gates, um, then you get an infinite temperature state. So mm -hmm. if you look at it locally, it just looks like the entity, right, at late enough times. Mm -hmm. um, you could, in principle, uh, if your gates were not um, right. Um, so with, with with gates like that, you always have you always have a time dependent system intrinsically because it's like a stroboscopically uh, shifting Hamiltonian, if you will, between the even bonds and the odd bonds. So you don't have conservation of energy, so it's uh, a bit contrived to get a finite temperature steady state right. in these models. But you right. could sort of tweak it to get a trotterization of some Hamiltonian and start from some finite temperature state and possibly get something uh, corresponding to, to a thermal state with a finite temperature. But yeah, it, at this level, it would be an infinite temperature state. OK, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks. That makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so did you say that the yeah. zero uh, monitoring rate of zero is thermal? Like, if, mm -hmm. But the rest of the yellow region is not thermal, although it's volume law? That's right. That's right. It's non-thermal. So zero is singular. Yes. Interesting. Yes. Um, how, in some ways, if you set P to be zero plus, just like epsilon, then mm. the nature of this non thermal phase would manifest itself after time of order one over P. Mm. So you would have to go to an, you know, clearly you would have to have enough measurements happen in your system for it to become aware that it's in this phase. Uh -huh. so, so it would take an, a divergent time to find out that there I are see. measurements. I see. So it's singular in that way, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, so um, so when you say it's non-thermal with volume law, um, does it, so do you mean it has a steady state? Um, and can we know what is that steady state? Right, so I'm going to say steady state sort of a few times across this, but I never actually mean steady state because the state hmm. keeps bouncing around specifically so, because of the measurements yeah. that are random, right? Uh, but, but various observables, observables you care about achieve a steady ensemble. So, so their means yeah, so converge it, yeah. to something and their, moment, yeah, so their moments converge to something. So is that similar to diagonal ensemble in the normal unitary dynamics? So is oh, that something uh, equivalent to that? Like, can you come it's, up with? Yeah, I guess that's the same framework, yes. Uh, if okay. you have a random unitary circuit, clearly your state is going to continue changing. But again, you, you can have a... Uh, okay. So, okay, so it can be calculated. It can be calculated. Uh, okay, so so that then it depends on exactly what your model is. So if this is floquet in some sense, like if your unitaries are the same in time and the measurements are forced to have the same outcome mm -hmm. every time, then you can diagonalize it and there is a steady state. Mm -hmm. But if your measurements are really measurements, so they have they have random outcomes, then there's nothing for you to really diagonalize. It's it's mm -hmm. um, you kind of have to follow the dynamics. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. 
Okay, great. So, uh, so this is this was very surprising and interesting, and in particular, it provides us with a new uh, type of entanglement phase transition that adds to this catalog we have, which is really very short. Like as far as I know, maybe there's examples I'm missing, but really the examples are the many body localized uh, phase, so the MBL transition, which separates. Um, you know, this is defined by the entanglement of eigenstates of a Hamiltonian or of a Floquet operator, um, which go sharply from having area law entanglement to volume law entanglement. So it separates a thermal from a non-thermal phase. And then in some sense, in quantum computation theory, you have these fault tolerance thresholds, which are asking about what happens if you have, if you're trying to do a quantum computation with uh, faulty components, like gates that sometimes are inaccurate and qubits that sometimes are lost, uh, as a function of the rate of of noise in your system, you can sharply transition from a phase where your computation succeeds to one where it fails. And this can also be characterized as a phase transition in the entanglement properties. Uh, but these are really, so it's a very short list. It's very interesting and exciting to have a new uh, element in it. And, and so this provides us with a new uh, domain to, to sort of ask questions about atomic equilibrium phase structure, which are uh, you know, very interesting frontier. So there's, these are some of the, uh, foundational papers on this. And then there's also an interesting perspective by Sid Prameshwaran on the Kunnats Marajona Club website from last month. So it's it's a very nice introduction if you're interested. Um, can um, I ask a quick question, Gats? Yep. Yeah. Um, is the value of PC dependent on the gate size? On the gate size, uh, yes, it's dependent on really everything. Like it's non-universal. So everything you change in the model is going to affect it. Uh, there are some bounds, like it's, uh, it can't be more than a half because of percolation. If you measure more than half the time, you just disconnect your circuit, for example. There's things like that, but otherwise it depends on the model. Okay, any more, any more questions about this uh, before I move on? Otherwise, um, yeah, so, so, so that was a very fast overview of the theory on, on the background of this, uh, but what we our angle on this is more motivated by experimental uh, or at least you know thought experiments on this, uh, how you could possibly do it. Um, and the problem that arises here, these measurements, has to do with the necessity of preparing the state many times over. And that's always true, even though, even though theorists maybe don't think about it much, but it's because when you do a measurement, you don't get the expectation value of the operator. You get one shot, which is typically discrete, right? You get if you're measuring the spin, you get up or down, and then you have to measure, you have to measure it many times and average over many outcomes in order to get whatever real number represents your expectation of sigma z, right? So that involves preparing the same wave function many times over, which can be sort of technically complicated in general because of again uh, quantum control and decoherence, but but those are more of an engineering challenges that we are hopefully getting better at and, and one day will overcome. But but with measurements, it's really more of a fundamental issue. So because of the randomness that's intrinsic in measurement outcomes, it's really impossible for you to deterministically uh, have the same uh, realization of the circuit many times, right? So to give you a, a toy example, imagine you set up this circuit with a few gates that you are perfectly capable of reproducing many times without error. And then you have some measurements that are sprinkled in and you get some sequence of outcomes. For example, in this first run, you get uh, up, down, and down. And then you set out to repeat it again and you set up the same thing, but uh, you know maybe at first you are lucky and you get a couple of outcomes that are the same, but then eventually just by chance, you're overwhelmingly likely to get one that's different. And once that happens, uh, you are in a bit of trouble because if you just pretend that it didn't happen and move forward and do your uh, you know, get your wave function and measure at the end, what you end up getting is um, an average over all of these um, states, which yields a density matrix that turns out to be featureless. Like it doesn't have this phase transition and its entanglement properties are kind of trivial throughout. So you can't just be that casual. You have to really be able to follow quantum trajectories, uh, which means specific sequence of these outcomes as you, as you go along. Um, so ways to do that, you know, naively you could uh, post select um, specific sequences of outcomes. So let's say you do this once, you get some sequence and then you decide from then on to only consider uh, realizations where you got that particular sequence from that moment onwards and, and just to throw away all the others. 
So that's going to work almost by construction, uh, but it comes at a really steep cost because it means that you're, you know, only a va exponentially vanishing fraction of your runs are going to be usable. The others are going to have to be discarded, basically. And if you're doing measurements with some density in space time, uh, some p between zero and one in space time, then the number of measurements in your in your circuit is going to scale with the product of system size and circuit depth, which gives you a really uh, really bad overhead, especially if you plan to scale to any sort of uh, thermodynamic limit or even just like medium sized system. That's going to be really costly. Um, so there are some ways around this. So one is to be um, not even try to prepare the state and just learn something from the measurement record, like just run it many, many times, collect statistics and evaluate some sort of entropic functional and try to learn about the phases. Uh, alternatively, you try to decode. Um, that means to whenever you get some outcome that's not what you wanted, you, you try to figure out what you should do in order to fix it. And if you have a powerful enough classical computer, you could do it. But in general, you know, for some simple models, you can do it. But in general, this can be a hard classical computation to do. And so in practice, you can't do it. Um, so the approach we're going to take here is different and consists in sort of accepting that there is this cost that's going to be exponential, but really try to lower the number of measurements that are being performed. So somehow effectively get some non-unitary evolution uh, at a lowered cost in the number of measurements that, that are to be made. And at this level, you know, this doesn't yet mean anything, but I'm going to explain it in a, in a moment. So, so that's that's the the introduction to what we want to do, and um, so, you know the the what I was, what I hope to cover would be uh, give you sort of present this concept of space time duality, which is this ultimately this uh, trick that allows us to do this, um, make these interesting non unitary circuits uh, in an experimentally motivated way, um, and then with these circuits we can prepare interesting steady states that exhibit a whole variety of uh, scalings of entanglement that some of those uh, are not found in conventional unitary circuits. And then if there is time, I, I, uh, I can present this uh, other work on doing um, at least some of these uh, experiments with absolutely no real measurements, so to speak. So with no post-selection and with the foreign principle uh, with present day quantum devices with, with no, uh, you know, with very basic resources. Okay. Um, so the idea of space time duality is, as the name suggests, it's, it's simply trying to exchange the roles of space and time, which um, let's start from the simple, simplest uh, building block for our circuits, which is this two qubit gate. It's an interaction between nearest neighbors. And uh, conventionally, you have you know, your two qubits, uh, I1 and I2, stands for inputs. They, they interact with each other, and, they, and you, know, you have output states that come out at the end. And um, this is marked by, you know, this is a unit operation. I'm going to mark it with this little arrowhead from, from here on out. That's the direction of unitarity. The idea is to view this uh, same object, same operation, but sideways. So we, we alternate hour of time, uh, t-twiddle. And again, uh, quantities with a tilde are going to refer to, to this space-time dual setting um, to distinguish them from the ones in the unitary setting. Um, and once you do that, so you have just the same thing, but with a different combination of inputs and outputs, which you can work out on paper. And it turns out to be generically a non-unitary matrix, um, but it's a deterministic one. So this gives us the interesting idea of, can we use this to, in some sense, simulate the effect of measurements, which will be the non-unitary part, without the randomness, which is it's sort of inconvenient to deal with experimentally. So to give an example of how this uh, could work on paper, um, consider the entity, so the simplest possible gate, right? Um, two qubits are coming in. These will be the, the word lines. They are not talking to each other, and they're going out after you know just not, not interacting. Uh, if you flip it on its side, you get uh, you know this matrix turns out if you reshuffle the entries in the in the correct way you get this matrix which is a projector uh, of rank one so it's a projector onto one particular state which turns out to be this particular bell pair state up up plus down down and diagrammatically this also makes sense like this uh, diagram with the two lines that uh, go from bottom to top becomes a diagram with these two lines that uh, so the incoming word lines collide and annihilate each other 
and then there's a new pair of word lines that are created and go out in the future. And this represents, um, so the downward arc represents projection onto a bell state, and then the upward arc represents creation of a new bell state, right? So the bra and the cat in this projector. And these are going to come back a few times in the following. So, so if this is confusing, now is a great time to ask a question about this. Uh, they're going to show up a few times. So at the level of the four by four matrix, um, how, how should I think of, you know, what am I doing? If I, yeah, so, if, if I don't want to keep referring to the indices. Um, right. So if you, if you want to visualize it as a four by four yeah. uh, square, you are changing. Mm -hmm. I don't have a slide on this, but like you're taking uh, two of them, like um, indices, I guess, zero, two and zero, three, like, and you're exchanging them with like one, zero, one, two. Mm. One zero okay. one, yeah. You're exchanging two blocks, um, mm. so it's uh -huh. right. So here, basically, these two guys, this zero and this one, are being exchanged with these two guys, uh -huh. and that gets you this one and ending up here. Mm. And kind of the same thing on the bottom, and that for this particular example ends up getting you this matrix. So it's a permutation mm. of the entries that, that mm -hmm. has a very simple, cool. Very cool. Right. Yeah. So this is, you know, this is neat, but it's just on paper, right? So obviously it doesn't mean mm -hmm. anything that we have this non-unitary thing that's uh, that's deterministic. You know, it doesn't mean we can do it in the lab, right? If we went to an experimentalist and told them, okay, do this, you know, flip a gate on its side, that's not something that they can sensibly do, right? So we have to mm -hmm. give an explanation of what, what we're doing here. But before I do that, just uh, quickly mention that this is not an entirely new idea. So there's been a few works in the past few years that have used this notion of um, looking at the sideways evolution associated to, to a unitary circuit in order to learn various interesting things about the associated dynamics. This has been used for chaos, for thermalization, localization, and even for uh, learning about the uh, computational complexity of a class of, of quantum circuits, two plus one D. Um, so in, in all these cases, you're, you're taking this evolution, looking at it sideways and, and, and learning something about the original unitary evolution. So what we set out to do is a little different in that it's about actually using that to engineer a non-unitary process in its own right, rather than learning about the associated unitary. Um, and in particular, I want to flag these works on dual unitary circuits, which have been very, uh, you know, have led to very interesting results on quantum chaos. And these dual unitary models are very special uh, classes of circuits that are such that uh, U-twiddle is also unitary. So if you take a, take a unitary circuit, flip it on its side, you get another unitary circuit. That's a very special constraint, but it's one that can be satisfied. And it has very, uh, as, you know, as consequences, it allows you to make a lot of analytical progress. Good, so that gets me to the more practical side of how we do this. Uh, you know, how could one sensibly implement this sideways evolution? Um, and the idea is to, rather than flipping, you know, each gate by itself, first you stack them to form a circuit you want, and then you try to, to flip the whole thing. That's basically the idea. And um, there are, like, if you were able to do this with uh, having an input state that's coming in on the left like this, and an output state that's produced on the right, uh, if you can do that, then the two states are related exactly by the dual evolution that you are targeting, trying to implement. So the question is now, um, you know, this is all fine in the bulk where it's just a unitary circuit, but the boundaries are a little funny. So we have to explain what's going on and how you could do it experimentally. Um, so the bottom and the top are fairly easy, particularly the bottom. Um, the, these arcs that we've encountered before are just bell states. So if you, if you initialize your qubits in uh, dimers of bell states, that implements these open boundary conditions for the circuit that you're trying to realize. And the same thing at the end of time, where unfortunately, you know, you can't force your wave function to achieve a certain final state. You know, the final state is whatever it is, but you can uh, measure it and post-select. So this is what I was, um, you know, the kind of costly process I was mentioning earlier. You would perform a sequence of bell measurements on these bonds. And um, whenever you get a state, you know, you get one of four possible outcomes, uh, you know, up, up, plus or minus, down, down, or up, down, plus or minus, down, up. 
And whenever you get something that is not this guy, so it's not up, up, plus, down, down, you will throw it away. And you would only keep it if it's up, up, plus, down, down on all the bonds. So that's obviously costly, but you know we'll, we'll keep track of these resources and discuss them in a moment. Uh, let's just say that you can do it, and that implements the open boundary conditions on the other edge of your uh, dual circuit. So these are uh, taken care of at this point. And the remaining issue is what to do with the input and output states, which exist on time-like surfaces. So these vertical walls are time-like. That means that like specific positions in space, like the left and right edge of your system, but viewed at different times. So it's kind of an unusual setting, and we have to explain how to convert it to something more familiar. So for the input state, the easiest thing is to just take this particular dimer of belt pairs, uh, which if you just do it, it it, it's naturally implemented as open boundary conditions in your laboratory. So if, if the left edge of your chain is simply um, evolving unitarily with open boundary conditions, then it naturally implements this type of initial state for the dual circuit. So uh, that's a short range entangled state, uh, and, and it's convenient, so we're going to stick with that. And then what's left to address is the output state, which exists on this other uh, time-like surface. And for that, we're going to um, basically use this trick of introducing a bunch of ancillary qubits. Uh, so these are other qubits you're bringing in from the outside uh, next to your system. And you are initializing them in the Bell state. And then you're, you're using swap gates. So whenever these two lines are crossing like that, that's a swap gate. It's exchanging the state of the qubits. And uh, as a result of that, you can basically, if you keep track of all of these dots, like those are just like guides to the eye for this is one particular cube in the output state. You can see that each one of them, you know, follows some, some weird path, but eventually ends up where it's supposed to be in the final state in, you know, at the final time. So this is just a, a trick that's basically inspired by quantum teleportation, which is a textbook quantum protocol where Alice and Bob are sharing a bell state and Alice can do some local manipulations, including measurements, to basically teleport her state over to Bob's side. So this is a dressed up version of that basic protocol in the many body setting. So it's obviously a bit more complicated, but, but it's the same idea. So is the benefit that um, you are getting a non-unitary circuit and you still have to do some measurements and post-selection, but you're not doing it everywhere, like in the middle, that you're only exactly. doing it at the Yes, I was edges. going to get to it. Yeah, I was going to get mm -hmm. to it right, right now. Okay. So, so that's yeah. perfect, yes, uh, exactly. So the benefit is that you're doing order L. If, you, if L is the size of your system, you're doing that number of measurements as opposed to you know, some density times the size and depth of you know, the bulk space and volume of your circuit. So that's exactly the, the benefit. So you're doing something that everywhere in the bulk looks like it's strongly non-unitary. You know, potentially, depending on the gates you choose, but you're doing so with very few measurements, relatively speaking. Like it's still a divergent number, so it's still going to prevent you from reaching a thermodynamic limit. But it's, you know, it, it's it could be worse. Like it's it's not bad, <laughs> some sense. So good. So hopefully this this is um, you know, this makes sense and it's it, it justifies thinking about these circuits in their own right as something that's not. You know, sometimes it's good to just write something down and see what it does, but it's also interesting to note that this can be done with sort of plausible experimental resources. It's not completely abstract. Uh, so, okay, so I'm going to go through uh, our first application of this idea, which is uh, realizing interesting steady states. And so, as you may imagine, because we're exchanging the roles of space and time, there might be a connection between entanglement growth in unitary circuits as a function of time, so like S of T with the spatial scaling of entanglement in these flipped circuits, so S twiddle of L twiddle. Just because of, you know, naively we're extending space and time, so we might expect a relationship there. So our program here is to go through the range of known behaviors for entanglement growth, which, uh, you know, in some class of models that you can easily, uh, you can easily uh, explore and that we know a lot about already, uh, you can realize a whole range of entanglement behaviors from uh, localized circuits where entanglement either hits some area law or grows very slowly, logarithmic in time, um, into a thermalizing phase where initially your entanglement grows sub with some power between zero and one. 
and then eventually into a chaotic phase where entanglement grows ballistically and possibly even these dual unitary circuits where it grows ballistically with a maximal velocity. Uh, so we would like to translate this range of behaviors for entanglement in time into different spatial scalings uh, for steady states of these circuits. Um, and the key technical um, tool that lets us do that is, is a mapping I'm going to show next. So the problem statement is, is basically this. We have this type of circuit that I introduced previously, and we're asking about the entanglement of a subsystem. So we're taking some of the output qubits, asking about the entanglement of that subsystem. And in particular, we care about late times. So this capital T twiddle should be taken very big, at least at the end. Um, and this is a different problem from the usual entanglement growth in unitary circuits, which looks more like this. And the two things may be the same in the bulk, but you're taking drastically different boundary conditions. And so it's not obvious uh, beforehand you know, what's, what it's going to do to the, to the entanglement. OK, so the, the state you produce here uh, from these gates and measurements, as I, as I described, is a pure state at this level. The state on A and A bar is pure. So the, the entropy of A really equals the information that's shared between A and A bar, because there's no third party to share information with. So this lets us do, um, uh, let's just simplify the problem in an important way. Because basically, it turns out that as you take the size of this complement to infinity, so you take this edge of the circuit off to infinity, you take it to be infinitely big. Uh, then it turns out that all the information that crosses, you know, sort of enters through A, crosses this cut B, all of that information that crosses B ends up encoded into A bar uh, in the limit where A bar is, inf is infinitely big. Technically, we can show that there is an isometry between these spaces, so the qubits that, that, that exist at B and, and the much larger number of qubits that exist in A bar. Uh, there is this isometry, which means that uh, basically you can forget about everything that's going on in this uh, big chunk of the circuit and really focus on this much smaller problem. Where now you have a state that's uh, bipartite, it exists on the subsystem A, which is the one you, interest, you originally cared about, and this new subsystem B, which is precisely at entanglement cut, but it's a space-like subsystem now. Um, it's um, you know, unlike you know, A is time-like and B is space-like. So it's kind of a weird state, but there's nothing wrong with it. It's a valid tensor network. You can ask about the entropy of either subsystem. Sorry, could, um, I, could I ask a question here quickly? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so you say that it's, uh, this is valid in the thermodynamic limit. Um, what, what happens, uh, like how, how do you need to change the statement when it's not yeah, yeah. the TD limit? Right, right. So, to give you a little feel for what's going on here, uh, the reason that this is true is that um, you know, in, in the thermodynamic limit is that once information crosses this cut, it's basically evolving unitarily, so it can only go forward in time. Like if you are a, a bit of information that's here, you are sort of forced to go forward. But that's mm -hmm. only true until you hit the ceiling. Mm -hmm. When you hit the ceiling, you can turn around and go back in time. OK, I see. So you might actually bounce back you, into A. Exactly. So, so that's an upper bound. So in, in the, mm -hmm. with a finite system, this same quantity is an upper bound to the entanglement. OK. All right. Thanks. And it only gets saturated in the thermodynamic limit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Good. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Yeah, this is a, a bit technical, so I'm not really going into it. I'm also kind of running late already. So I'm going to uh, try to get to the main punchline. So yeah. So. Um, because we have a pure state here, we can get the entropy of A by tracing out either A or B. It doesn't really matter. It's the same thing. So it's convenient to trace out subsystem A and get a density matrix on B. So doing that means that you have now two layers of the circuit. One of them is this cat, and one of them is this bra. So you can imagine the, the cat is the top layer, the yellow gates, and um, the bra is the bottom layer or the shaded gates. And then you have to, um, this partial trace, amounts to connecting the cat and the bra along those particular qubits, which, which would be these closed loops here on where A used to be. But now you can interpret this process uh, going forward in uh, you know, laboratory time, physical time, as having a unitary evolution everywhere in the bulk, except at this particular edge qubit, where what's happening is um, 
a, a, a fully depolarizing channel, which is a kind of decoherence process where your qubit is constantly being traced over and replaced by junk, so the identity uh, state on that qubit. Um, so entropy is being injected on that side and then is being propagated into the bulk by the unitary part of the circuit. And it's giving you this mixed state that has some amount of entropy. And that entropy is exactly the entropy we set out to calculate before. So this is the, the punchline. Uh, we have this connection between entropy in the states produced by non-unitary dynamics and these other states, mixed states, produced by unitary dynamics with the coherence at the edge. And this becomes, part, you know, we particularly care about the limit in which this depth becomes big and we can forget about it. So we send the left edge off to infinity uh, like, like this. And then we have basically uh, this result, which tells us that this, the spatial scaling of steady state entanglement in these dual circuits equals um, the temporal growth of entropy in a semi-infinite chain where one edge is being decohered at all time steps. So, so yeah, there are two things going on here. One is the exchange of space and time, which you might have expected from space-time duality, right? You have a spatial scaling on the left and a temporal scaling on the right. But the other bit that's a bit more surprising is the role of this uh, decoherence process on this side, which wasn't present on the other side. So this is the main technical tool, and I want to, uh, you know, briefly show you what we get from this, um, and. Um, so going back to this whole catalog of uh, temporal scalings of entanglement in, in unitary circuits, uh, we obtain these results for a spatial scaling in, in their duals, which is very, you know, it looks very similar. So to zeroth order, it, it's a one-to-one -one correspondence. Um, but so, so, so that already gets us something interesting, which is that these uh, sub-ballistic entanglement growth in these thermalizing Griffiths models. So this sort of uh, thermalizing systems with strong disorder close to localization transition, uh, where the entanglement grows slowly, it translates onto this fractional power scaling, which is really not seen genetically in unitary circuits, as far as, as, far as we know. Uh, there are a few special counterexamples in either free models or particular Hamiltonians with algebraic properties that are fine-tuned, but, but really this is showing up in disordered models with generic many-body interactions, and, and so that's kind of an novel uh, phenomenon that's enabled by uh, non-unitarity. Um, and the other interesting thing, if you look very closely, you'll see that some things actually don't go through. So in particular, this area of scaling of entanglement in the Anderson localized phase, where entropy saturates to a constant, uh, that actually becomes a logarithmically divergent uh, entanglement scaling, and that's a consequence of the HD coherence. And similarly, a logarithmic uh, correction pops up also in the duals of chaotic models. And uh, this volume law term with a logarithmic sublinear correction is actually also seen in generic unitary measurement circuits. So it's very interesting that we see it here. And it suggests that these two phases, you know, the duals of chaotic circuits may actually be in the same universality as general unitary measurement uh, circuits in the, in the volume law phase. Okay, so uh, you know I have slides for all of these, uh, but I see I'm running a little late, so I'm probably gonna skip past delocalized circuits, um, and I'll tell you briefly about the, the fractal uh, fractal entanglement to observe. So, so basically, as you cross from the localized phase into the thermalizing phase, uh, your entanglement growth does not go immediately ballistic. Um, there is a regime where your system sort of there are patches that are very strongly disordered and basically behave as if they were localized and so they they constitute bottlenecks for your entanglement growth um your entanglement takes exponentially long to go to go across them but they have a finite size and so this kind of conspires to give you this ballistic this sub ballistic scaling so the, the issue is that this is kind of a tough thing to model microscopically because um you know almost by construction, it manifests in, on very long length scales, so it's complicated to study. So it's useful to, to, to consider a coarse grain model. In particular, there is this circuit model by uh, Nahum, Ruman, and Hughes from a couple of years back, where the idea is to take a unitary circuit where gates are dropped down on the various bonds with different rates. So some bonds basically rep represent um, bottlenecks in the entanglement growth. So Imagine there is a region where entanglement growth is extremely slow, 
And that is being represented here as a particular bond where there's almost never any gates. Like there's a gate every some very long time, right? So that, that constrains your uh, growth or entanglement between everything that's to the left and the right of, of that particular bond. So you can construct this by assigning to each bond a rate, uh, gamma, between 0 and 1, sampled from some distribution, which has um, this form here, this power law form controlled by an exponent. And it turns out that that controls exactly the power of the entanglement growth. This was found in this paper. Uh, and it lets you basically tune it from, from 0 to 1 as you change this exponent, which tunes the concentration of, of bottlenecks. So that's what we uh, plan to simulate, because this is exactly in the setup of unitized circuits that we, we can dualize. And interestingly, what happens when you dualize this, so you look at it uh, with, with the arrow of time going sideways, uh, what happens then is that these bottlenecks are not spatial bottlenecks for the growth entanglement, but they're temporal bottlenecks for um, basically they're, they're events, they're events in time where almost all of your bonds are being projected. So they're being measured on this particular two qubit bell states. And so your state is sort of almost getting destroyed, except for a very sparse network of, of sites that are not being measured and that basically store all of the remaining entanglement in this very sparse way. And so this is um, the repetition of this overall time scales is what prevents your entanglement from ever saturating to a volume law. And uh, we can simulate this and we can have an analytical derivation that mirrors the one in the, in the unitary case. And this gives you exactly that, um, that kind of um, fractional power uh, scaling that we expected. Um, and um, not only that, so that's the, that's the scaling of the average entropy, but obviously these circuits are strongly random. Uh, so not just the average of the entropy, but all of the moments and in, actually the entire distribution collapses onto the scaling ansatz. So if you rescale by some power, suitable power of the size of the system, then the entire distribution collapses. And that tells you that if you take a state and look at its entropy profile, then it's statistically self-similar overall length scales. So as you zoom out and zoom out and zoom out, you get something that uh, statistically looks the same. So it's not a fractal in the sense that like a Cantor set or a Sierpinski triangle or something like that. Like it's not a clean fractal, but it's a statistical fractal. Like it, uh, it has the statistical self-similarity property. So this is a very interesting uh, phenomenon that's not yet seen as far as we know in, in generic unitary many body dynamics, there are some interesting examples with some particular fine tuning, but basically this is a, um, an, a, a robust behavior we, that we can observe in this setting that's not allowed otherwise, as far as we know. So, right, then I'll also skip past the chaotic circuits, other than telling you that basically we have, um, you know, we initially found this one half log L correction because we were thinking about systems near the edge and thought that that signaled a different phase from the one that was known in more general unitary measurement problems. Uh, but then we realized that if you actually looked at the same thing for a subsystem in the bulk of an infinite system, we actually got three halves. And that matches exactly with the result that's uh, at least conjectured to be valid in this non thermal volume of phase in the presence of measurements. So there is an interesting open question, I guess, about whether or not this space and dual circuits realize the same phase or not. Uh, and you know, at, at this level, they agree there are some finer diagnostics that we're sort of we're currently looking at that suggest that they might be different, but uh, yeah, that's, I would say, still an open question. And uh, right, so I'm at, I think I'm at, I'm at 40 something minutes, so I had some uh, more, more stuff, but I'm, I'm also happy to, to stop here if there are questions or however or whatever you prefer. Uh, so I had a quick I, question. Oh, sorry. I, I think we've been asking questions, so maybe we can mm -hmm. continue on with okay, yeah, this questions is... keep getting asked. Aaron has a question. Yeah, so, on the, pre yeah, so on the previous slide, um, uh, I'm, I don't, maybe I missed this earlier, but how do you sharply define uh, whether or not the two, uh, two things are in the same or a different phase? in this setting? Um, right, I mean, that's, so it, in some sense it will be trivial to establish that they're different. Like if you found some, something that should be universal and 
and it's different in two cases, then you know that they're not the same phase. Um, if you somehow keep finding agreement, then it's maybe it's not, it, yeah, it, it doesn't resolve it either way. Uh, but yeah, so somehow it, it would be like, I guess the only conclusive way would be to find a, a, a theory that like a coarse grain theory that describes this phase and and show that it's the same as the theory that describes the other phase. Uh, but that's, um, yeah, we don't have that yet, so. I see, thanks. But the rough diagnostic, diagnostic that you're looking for is whether uh, T in the unitary case, T gets replaced by L, mm -hmm. is it roughly? Because you're, you've done, you've gotten your non-unitary yeah, so by dualizing. Yeah, yeah. So, for example, uh, you know the the entropy density here mm -hmm. is actually given by the entanglement velocity of the unitary circuit. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. entanglement velocity would be entropy per unit time, and mm -hmm. this plays the role of entropy per unit length. So that's mm -hmm. also following mm -hmm. from that exchange of space and time, right? Mm -hmm. um, so this is this is fine. But 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 even in the unitary measurement case, you can tune the entropy density however you want, basically by tuning mm -hmm. the density of measurements. Mm -hmm. So this becomes maximal with zero measurements, and then it goes to zero continuously as you as you approach the measurement density that gives you the phase transition. So this mm -hmm. is um, not necessarily universal. What's universal mm -hmm. uh, is the logarithmic correction, mm -hmm. and this coefficient agrees with the two between the two phases. Yeah, but so, it's a log of t versus log of l, right? Oh, log the of logarithmic oh, correction. Uh, I see. I see. Um, so in in just closed unitary circuits, if you look at two halves, then this logarithmic correction is not there. Uh, mm -hmm. Interestingly, it's it's just the ballistic part. Mm -hmm. um, this comes about because of the, so yeah, I'm not gonna go through this in detail, but basically for a unitary circuit, you have your two subsystems A and A bar, and you have this entropy calculation becomes a random walk calculation where your random walker can, can freely walk left or right, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Throughout the space time. Mm -hmm. With edge decoherence, which is the setting we care about for our space and duality, the random walker, when it collides with the edge, it gets a penalty, like it, its probability mm -hmm. decreases. So it has a probability mm -hmm. of being absorbed by the edge. And it's this absorption that gets you the logarithmic term. Mm -hmm. Like it, the, the, the non conservation of probability gets you the square root of t factor. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then when you take the log to get the entropy, because entropy mm -hmm. is logarith is the log of this, you get this one half log L. And you will get mm -hmm. a three halves if you did it with a suitable mm -hmm. boundary conditions. So so that's a specific property of the dual somehow, which mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. has to do with non-unitarity. Yep. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us a little bit about how to put this in the lab? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is going to be very not quick, that so. any of us actually do experiments, <laughs> but still we, yeah, we yeah, like yeah. to know. <laughs> exactly, it's more more about thought yeah. experiments. Yes. So yeah. so I told you briefly <laughs> earlier about the setup where you have order L measurements, and that's already you know that's fine if you want to do it on say ten qubits or so. That's fine because, for example, the Google machine operates on like the kilohertz frequency, like you know thousand samples per per second or so. So. Uh, you know, if you need to post select on a few thousands of, uh, you know, if your overhead is of, of a few thousands, that's fine. But of course, that gets complicated when you, if you want to do more than say 20 qubits, then your overhead gets into the millions and then billions, and then that gets really tricky. And so it's important, or or at least it, you know, we desirable to have some things that you can do without any measurements. And what we can do is a slightly different problem that's very closely related to the one that I just told you about. Um, and it's the so-called dynamical purification of mixed states. So here we are thinking about initializing the system in the identity, so maximally mixed state, and then running it through non-unitary evolution. So if your evolution is unitary, then of course the identity is invariant because it just gives you, you know, u times u dagger equals the identity again, so it doesn't evolve. But precisely because your u twiddle uh, isn't unitary, then you can get some interesting states as you evolve your, your initial identity. And the question is, do you get a pure state, so a projector on a single state, or do you retain a mixed state for a long time? 
So not necessarily the identity, but some other mixed state with, with you know, perhaps less entropy, but some finite amount of some finite entropy density at late times. And the interesting uh, fact here that was shown by uh, Michael Gallans and David Hughes in, in these papers is that this question gets you a sharp definition of phase structure that basically mirrors almost, I guess, one to one, uh, almost exactly, uh, with the notion of entanglement phases that I discussed at the beginning. So where you had a pure state at the beginning and you were asking about the scaling of entanglement in the final state with, in space, right? So here the question is a bit different. We're looking at a mixed state and we're looking at its entropy as a whole, like as a mixed state. Uh, but it turns out that um, in the unitary measurement case, for example, these two phase transitions are at the same place and the two phases are basically closely related to, to each other. So slightly different problem, but the advantage of thinking about uh, this problem is that it lets us uh, basically get the order parameter for this phase uh, without any, any real measurements in our space-time dual, you know, in our class of space-time dual circuits. Um, so basically the thing we care about is ideally the entropy, but the thing that's easier to calculate or measure is the purity, so trace of rho squared. And the entropy would be minus log of this quantity, right? So to get trace of rho squared, uh, you have to interfere in some sense two copies of the state to get this uh, squared and, and this trace. And if this is one copy, which again, it has identities coming at the bottom, they are evolved through these non unitary things, and then there's legs sticking out at the top. Um, you can produce two copies of, of this guy and um, stick them together and you get purity. So this diagram here is the purity. And then basically I'm just gonna, okay, so what we plan to do is to take advantage of space and duality in order to measure this, this diagram as a whole, which is this entropic function uh, as a correlator in a unitary evolution and without post-selection on any measurement outcomes. And we outline a protocol for how to do this on basically present day digital quantum simulators. And the idea uh, that I'm just going to flash with, with animations at this point is uh, that you can, by rotating space and time, you can turn uh, this diagram of interest into something else that looks almost entirely unitary. So it has some prescribed initial state that you can prepare, some, you know, a bell pair somewhere and then mixed states. Uh, and then there are unitary gates. And then there are measurements at particular places. So these bell measurements here, but they are not post-selected. So there are measurements that give you either, you know, some state or some other state, and they're going to use all of that information to uh, reconstruct the value of the diagram, which gives you the purity. So I'm not gonna go through this in detail, but I'll just flash it here. This is basically the protocol, uh, which functions like a little flow chart. It's like, do this, perform this measurement, depending on what you get, do that or, or you know, stop or continue and keep track of how many times you failed versus how many times you made it to the end and succeeded. And if you do that, you, you end up with this, uh, you know, some number of trials, some number of successful trials and the ratio gives you exactly the purity. That is what we set out to, uh, to calculate. And um, now, um, basically, if this um, number of successful trials is decaying exponentially with the number of measurements, which is kind of intuitive because uh, you want some outcome to occur over and over, so you expect that the joint probability should decay exponentially, uh, then this exponential decay translates to uh, an entropy which is divergent, uh, which is extensive, and, uh, and then you can measure the entropy density, which is again the order parameter for the mixed phase as this uh, decay time constant from this exponential. So if your device has a good enough coherence time that you can you know, measure, you know, do enough runs and get a good enough uh, decay over a few time steps that you can fit it to an exponential, that's your measurement of the entropy density without any uh, post-selection or decoding of measurements. So objective here is to measure the entropy. Um, yes. But measure the entropy of some special state, that non-unitary state, that's the dual. So the yes. point is you have a non-unitary state 
from that perspective. But mm -hmm. in this perspective, you can measure the entropy. The entang I guess it's entanglement entropy or yeah, yeah. The, the, yeah the second Rennie entanglement entropy. Second Rennie entropy. You can measure sure, the second yes, Rennie so. entropy yeah. of this state that was non-unitary without having to do any post selection. Yes, it basically mm -hmm. maps on to just this multi-point mm -hmm. correlation function. Mm -hmm. Like each one of these measurements is really this is how you do it in the lab, but as a on paper, mm -hmm. it's like a, a T point correlation function of some projector mm -hmm. that you can calculate. Cool. And uh, cool. so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a highly constrained set of models mm -hmm. you can do. And these mm -hmm. particular shape, like why is a triangle? It's because of the light cone emanating from mm -hmm. the bottom and the top, like because everything mm -hmm. is unitary. Uh, so it's, it's, it's got some funny boundary conditions and you're sort of constrained in the class of models you can explore, but you really can do it with sort of conventional Very resources. Cool. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, so I'll, just, I'll just flash a little recap. So we introduced this concept of space and duality, which again was sort of already out there, but we've applied it to engineering interesting non-unitary circuits that are physically motivated. We've made a class of interesting states, including these fractally entangled states that are sort of novel in some ways. We may have an example of the universal non-thermal volume entangled phase in these uh, dual soft chaotic circuits. Um, and then we've we've outlined this protocol for doing this uh, measurement induced purification dynamics without any randomness. And then just for the future, you know, uh, this is a this, this frontier of quantum dynamics involving non unitary processes is really interesting and it's kind of new. We don't really, you know, we've begin, begun to explore it, but there's undoubtedly many more interesting things to be found. And um, yeah, so with this, uh, be happy to take any more questions if. If there are any left, and yeah, I'll thank my collaborators <laughs> and, and everyone who helped us with discussions. And also, yeah, there was a joint paper um, by Tarun Groves group that came out on the same posting as our recent preprint that also studied some of these same questions from a slightly different perspective. Thank you so much. Um, are there any questions? I know we're kind of over time, but you know, if Mateo is willing, and if people who want to ask questions are willing, I think we can go for 10 more minutes, maybe. I, I, I'm here as long as needed. So I uh, apologize okay. for going a little over time, I guess. But um, you know what you should apologize for is doing giving too good a talk. Now you've set the expectation for this series way too high. I, I've told people <laughs> that, you know, I don't promise great speakers, students no, I look, I, stocks. Yeah, uh, I would have loved to. You do kicked more us like off a... so well, so this is awesome. So questions. Yeah, yeah, I agree with Una. That was a fantastic talk. Um, Thank you. I was I was wondering if you have uh, some thoughts or already some results in higher dimensions or something you're thinking about, and if you could elaborate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very interesting. Very interesting question. Um, so everything that I told you about today is strictly for one plus one d, and um, you know not super trivial to generalize, I guess. Uh, but so in this joint paper by Tarun Grover, they do look at one two plus one D model. I mean, obviously the way you would set that up is you have some, some time coordinates and then some D spatial coordinates and you would exchange time with one of the spatial coordinates and you would get some, some non-unitary circuit. Um, there, it seems like some things change pretty sharply. So for example, in our setup, we can rule out aerial of phases pretty convincingly, like, um, okay, yeah. So, so, you know, where you expected naively an aerial of phase, you don't get it. And we have a proof that basically you can only get an aerial of phase if your circuit is really, really trivial. Like if, if you're physically disconnected two parts of your circuit and there's no gates that couple them, then of course you can get something that's area law, but otherwise you can't. It seems like in two plus one, you might be able to do that. And so, yeah, um, certainly we expect some of our results will change uh, the, um, yeah, what else is, is there to say? Um, I mean, this thermalizing Griffiths, is that completely wiped out or does something like that still remain? Yeah, so I don't know what the state of the art is in what we know about um, that in, in higher dimension because that is kind of, um, it exists in 
like 1D is very special because if you have a patch of a one-dimensional system that's very localized, then it can really bottleneck the propagation of entanglement. Whereas mm -hmm. in 2D, if you have a patch that's localized, entanglement can kind of go around. Mm -hmm. So you don't necessarily expect that uh, subballistic okay. scaling in higher dimension. As setting aside all questions about whether or not MBL itself is stable, which maybe, maybe not, but, but um, this, I don't think the subballistic scaling should go through. So in that case, obviously, you don't expect Mm -hmm. um, the fractal phase to, to exist. That's an interesting question. Though. I hadn't thought about that. All right. Yeah. Thanks mm -hmm. again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I had a basic question about the, um, the setup. So what are the conditions for, was the statement that any unitary circuit when rotated becomes a, a unitary measurement circuit or was it the other way around or what exactly were the conditions mm -hmm. where this works? Yeah, so if you take a unitary uh, gate or you know circuit, if you build it up, but let's 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 take it small and, and do a gate. If you rotate it, you generically get something non-unitary. But there are special cases where you get something that's also unitary. So it's some system of equations that it has to satisfy, and so it's some sub subdimensional manifold in the space of unitary gates that have this property of being dual to another unitary. Uh, but generically, you get a you know, you get some non-unitary object, which you can always do a polar decomposition and write it as a product of a unitary and a Hermitian thing. And the Hermitian thing is basically like imaginary time evolution, e to the minus beta h, which you can think of, if you want, as a forced weak measurement. So it's like, um, it's not quite a projector, but it's like, um, it's because a projector has eigenvalues that are either one or zero, but a weak measurement could have eigenvalues that are anywhere in between. That's the kind of object you obtain genetically. Okay. So, so you were t so you were starting with something unitary and then rotating it. But does yep. the the original problem that you posed was about these unitary measurement circuits? Do those oh, always? You, can you always realize those this way, or this is just no, some very no. special class of those? Or these are some exactly, yes. Yeah. Sorry, I guess I uh, didn't catch this um, question. The object of the question, but yes, these are a very special subclass. Um, I think that there is a nice way of thinking about these as sort of a um, symmetry protected phase. Like it, it, their dual being unitary is a very special constraint, which, for example, rules out area of states, uh, whereas in the simple unitary measurement problem, area of states are kind of the default. Like most of the time you get an area of state unless you're you know, low enough measurement rate. Uh, in our case, these states are basically impossible. So we think of that as some sort of symmetry protected uh, feature of, of these particular unitary measurement circuits. Yeah. Can you make that mapping exactly? Like, you know, what type of constraint on a unitary plus measurement is equivalent to your dualized non-unitary. So I, I guess the statement is that unitary plus measurement is non-unitary. And mm -hmm. here is a way to get non-unitary from unitary, right? Mm -hmm. right? But then can you take a unitary plus measurement under some special condition to realize this you know, dualized unitary? Do you, do you know? So first of all, I guess the I answer guess, to Tom's earlier question is sort of in that realm, right? Yeah, yeah. So first of all, as a way of, so if you give me a unitary measurement model and ask me whether it's in this class, I think that mm -hmm. I, I couldn't do anything better than just rotate it and ask whether that's unitary. It's mm -hmm. a bit unsatisfactory. Mm -hmm. It's just like mm -hmm. brute force check, right? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know of any, uh, easier or more efficient uh, check you could do. Uh, mm -hmm. I guess genetically single site measurements are um, problematic. Like um, mm -hmm. a single site measurement, if you do it, so if you draw things with these legs at 45 degrees, mm -hmm. like, like in this circuit, then a single site measurement is something that naively rotates into itself. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, however you, you rotate the circuit, it still looks like a measurement. So that's mm -hmm. kind of not good. So the type mm -hmm. of measurements you get in this particular class of circuits is typically two-site bell measurements that once mm -hmm. you rotate them, they look like mm -hmm. 
uh, you know, they look like this. They look like qubit mm -hmm. board lines that are that are going somewhere. So that's fine. Um, so that's kind of a heuristic, like you know, two site measurements probably better than than one site measurements. Mm. But there are also cases where single site measurements end up playing this role in these guys. So it's not mm. completely obvious. Um, mm. Yeah, I don't, that's that's not a great. Answer, so you know, there were there's it there there's still more to be understood. Yes, for sure. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Any other questions? Well, if not, let's thank Matteo again. And I also thank you to everybody who came. This was really fun. And, yeah, thank um, you so much for having me. All right. Very nice. Thank you for the talk. Bye, Bye. everybody. There will be you know, uh, reminders for upcoming talks in, in the future. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Matteo. Thank you. Bye.